the staff of life. Whether baked, fried, or boiled, Ooh, hot. it's the basic source of nourishment for half the world. Grill it, roast it, slice it, toast it. It's a wonder that two ingredients, flour and water, can be transformed into so many different shapes and tastes. Beautiful. White bread may still be king in the U.S., but other breads are closing in. Now, the untold story of bread on Modern Marvels. Call it pan or pa, ekmek or bolt. Every culture has its bread. It started with wheat in the Middle East about 10,000 years ago, when someone left their porridge by the fire and it dried into a thick cracker. By 5,000 BC, the Egyptians had discovered how to make that cracker rise. Bread became the coin of the realm and was payment for those who worked on the pyramids. The ancient Greeks developed 70 kinds of bread and were the first to go on record as having a preference for the sweet taste of white bread. That preference continues today in the U.S., one of the biggest bread-eating nations in the world. The average American eats 53 pounds every year, mostly white bread, mostly this one. Ooh, that's smart. Buttered rich bread, one squeeze tells you why people call us the fresh guy. Oh. Wonder Bread is the biggest selling bread in America, produced by the biggest bakery in the nation, Interstate Bakeries Corporation, or IBC. It's manufactured in over 25 regional IBC facilities and shipped to over 155,000 markets. 353 million loaves translate to about three and a half billion sandwiches. At one of their largest and most modern bakeries in Lexana, Kansas, IBC employs the latest in manufacturing technology on a massive scale. Three tall bins you see right behind me are filled with uh, white flour that we use for making Wonder Bread. They hold about 150,000 pounds each. And we go through uh, roughly about 840,000 pounds in a week. The creation of a loaf of Wonder Bread is a symphony of speed and efficiency. From start to finish, it takes just six and a half hours. First, sugar, yeast, and flour are mixed with water into a 1,000 pound ball called a sponge and left to rise. In three hours, the yeast makes the dough double in size. Next, the sponge is dropped into a one-ton mixer. More flour, yeast, sugar, and water are piped in from the silos. 5% of the mixture is liquid sugar, which gives Wonder Bread its popular, slightly sweet taste. Additional ingredients like dough conditioners, preservative enzymes, and mold inhibitors are added by hand. But it's the enriched flour of Wonder Bread that has been its calling card. In 1941, the U.S. government asked food manufacturers to voluntarily add 8B vitamins to their products to prevent diseases caused by malnutrition. Wonder Bread agreed. It gave the nutrition that they needed to virtually eliminate those diseases. And because of it, it evolved to a campaign that was build strong bodies. The enriched ingredients emerge after 12 and a half minutes in the mixer as over 2,000 pounds of Wonder Dough. For the next three and a half hours, the dough will be constantly on the move, virtually untouched by human hands. The half-filled bread pans enter a warm, humid vault where they circulate slowly for the next hour. This is called the proofing stage, because as the dough rises, it is proof that the yeast is active and doing its job. Inside the dough, the yeast cells begin to feed on the dough sugars and metabolize. The byproducts of this interaction are carbon dioxide and alcohol. As the carbon dioxide expands, it becomes trapped by the dough, causing it to rise. The rising continues until the sugars are consumed, or until the yeast is killed by the heat of the oven. Much of the alcohol is devoured by bacteria in the dough, contributing to the signature taste of the bread. The rest will be burned off in the oven. 
Now right here you're looking at our oven that we bake the product in. It's approximately 175 feet long, has eight zones in it. We bake uh, for an average of about 18 to 18 and a half minutes. Here's our bread being de-panned. There's these suction cups with about 20 pounds of vacuum. They'll lift it out of that pan, set it on the belt, and it travels up into our cooler. At this stage, the interior of the loaf is over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It will need to be cooled to 100 degrees before it can be sliced and wrapped. Wrapping it too soon would cause condensation in the package, ruin the crust, and promote mold growth. It's been six and a half hours since we started making this bread that's right behind me here. Uh, it's in the final process of wrapping. It gets sliced and then packaged, put on a rack, sent to our shipping department. In 1930, Wonder Bread was one of the first brands to slice its loaves. Initially, the public was skeptical, fearing that sliced bread would go stale too quickly. But it gradually caught on. Today, it's a sign of high praise to be the best things in sliced bread. Wonder Bread's name was invented in 1921 when a baking company executive went to a hot air balloon exhibition. And he looked up and he saw with a sense of wonder all of these balloons. And it occurred to him, what a great name for a product. And that's how Wonder Bread got its name. It's also why the red, yellow, and blue balloons are still an icon on the label. Wonder Bread is baked five days a week and delivered the day after it's baked. The baking days are indicated by the color of the packing ties blue, green, red, white, or yellow. White bread continues to be the biggest selling bread in America. And Wonder Bread is the leader of that pack. Every loaf of Wonder Bread, and most other American breads as well, starts in a wheat field. 100,000 square miles of wheat are harvested every year in the U.S. An area equal to the entire state of Colorado. Every grain of wheat has three elements. The protective outer layer called bran, which contains vitamins and fiber. The germ, which is the embryo of a new wheat plant, is made up of oils and minerals. And the endosperm, which provides the nutrients for a new plant, mostly protein and starch. White flour is pure starchy endosperm. Separating that out has been the goal of every flour mill since the beginning days of bread making. One of the most modern mills in America is the Hal Ross Mill at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. Here, students and professors experiment with the latest in milling technology in a full-scale functioning flour mill. This uh, wheat that we're going to mill today is hard red winter, and it gets its name because the outside of the berry is reddish brown, and the inside of the berry is hard and vitreous, and so about 75% of the inside part of that kernel we can turn into white flour. The rest of it ends up in a byproduct, either as feed or maybe as bran in a breakfast cereal or a bran muffin or something like that. Today's mills are an elaborate labyrinth of pressurized tubes and equipment that move the grain particles from floor to floor. The grinding operation begins on the first floor, where stainless steel rollers do the work of the ancient millstones. Whole kernels are coming down, being fed in to what we call a double high roller mill. We've got two sets of big steel rolls, one on top of the other, that this product is passing through to be broken apart to try to remove these chunks of endosperm from the kernel. We've got here a five-story building. We've got equipment spread across all floors. So as we lift the particles by negative air up to the top floor and then drop it into a sifter. Inside the vibrating sifter is a series of screens of smaller and smaller apertures. The flakes of bran and the oily wheat germ particles are sifted out at the top levels. The smaller powdery particles of endosperm fall through to the bottom. On the large size, we have big bran flakes, and clear over on this side, we've got flour. So out of that mixture, we've separated the finest particles for flour from the largest. In the middle, we've got some particles that still need to be processed. Optic sensors isolate and remove defective grains of wheat. High-speed impact machines destroy any insect eggs or parts. And flour streams with distinct quality features allow the miller to make an infinite variety of flour mixes. Here we've got uh, the ability to take samples from each of the different flour streams in the mill. Knowing how to mix the flour streams to get the best quality white flour requires more than just a good eye. 
Across the Kansas State campus in the Bakery Science Laboratory, scientists have devised dozens of tests to check the quality of the flour and the bread that it bakes. The texture analyzer measures the firmness of baked bread. A machine called the extensograph tests how well the flour responds to kneading and mixing. And this device, the alveograph, tests how well dough will retain the carbon dioxide air bubbles created by the yeast by testing the quality of one of bread's key and unique components, gluten. Wheat contains a protein called gluten protein. It's the only cereal grain that contains gluten. Um, when it develops, gluten forms into a cohesive mass that is able to retain gas. So when you're making bread, the yeast is fermenting, is producing gas, this gluten protein can hold that gas inside the dough. That's why your dough can raise to give you a nice expanded loaf of bread. This ability to retain gases and to rise is unique to wheat flour and was recorded by the Egyptians around 5000 BC. It was completely, completely luck. Somebody was having a, a porridge or a gruel that they left out too long, you know, prehistoric, Paleolithic times, and wild yeast got in there and they left a little more and they noticed that it started bubbling and when they baked it, it wasn't dense and hard, it was light and expanded. They had unlocked the power of the yeast spores that occur naturally on grain and in the air. For the next 7,000 years, bakers learned to hold back a portion of their fermented dough, called the mother dough, to mix with additional flour and water, creating new batches of yeasted dough. But the actual science behind leavening bread remained a mystery until 1859, when Louis Pasteur discovered that yeast was a single-cell living organism. With that knowledge, scientists soon learned how to grow yeast separate from the dough. This sparked a revolution in bread production. At the Fleischmann's yeast factories in Memphis, Tennessee and Montreal, Canada, new life is created every second of the day. Selected yeast microbes are mixed into vats of yeast's favorite food, warm, unrefined molasses, a byproduct of sugar production that would otherwise go to waste if it weren't perfect for developing bread yeast. This fermentation process is very similar to brewing beer. The difference is, once the 36-hour fermentation is complete, Fleischmann's throws out the alcohol and keeps the yeast. Yeast responds to the slightest changes in environment, so scientists monitor every batch. Fermentation produces a brew called liquid cream yeast, which is shipped out in tankers and trains to bakeries across the country. But some is destined for home use. Sheets of cream yeast are further dried on stainless steel drums and scraped to make cake yeast. Additionally, the cake yeast can be broken down into granules and slowly dried. This process, invented by Fleischmann's in the 1940s, causes the yeast to go dormant. This is called dry yeast and can last up to two years in this form or until it's mixed with warm water and brought back to life to make bread rise. Though most commercial bakeries use some form of concentrated yeast, San Francisco sourdough is still made the old-fashioned way with stinky fermented mother dough. <laughs> it just gets you so strong. A combine harvests enough wheat for about 70 loaves of bread in nine seconds. Bread will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Bread on Modern Marvels. The story of American bread is the story of immigrants and the blending of cultures. Native Americans, European settlers, and African slaves all brought their baking traditions to this country. The mix gave rise to some uniquely American breads. There are few places in the world where the local bread is so singular that it becomes synonymous with the city of its origin. But when it comes to sourdough, everyone knows the city is San Francisco. Along the docks of Fisherman's Wharf is a new building that houses the oldest bakery in town, Boudin Sourdough Bakery. They've been using the same sourdough starter for the last 160 years. I'm going to show you something that if I, if I lose these, I have to shut the doors. I, can, I cannot make sourdough bread anymore if I lose this. But of course, we will not do that. But I, actually, I'm going to show you how it looks like. This piece of dough dates back to 1849. 
I've been taking care of her almost for the past 30 years. That's been my job, the caretaker of this baby. These pots of fermented dough were created by mixing one part pre-fermented mother dough with 20 parts flour and water and left to sit for one day. Okay, look at these. It's just a piece of dough yesterday that started very small. This is what flavors the sourdough, the famous San Francisco sourdough bread. Look at these, look at these. You break it up, <coughs> it just gets you so strong. So I'm gonna throw it in here and it's ready to go. Sourdough bread requires no additional yeast because the mother dough is alive with local San Francisco yeast spores. The weather here in San Francisco is so special. There is the spores go into this flour and water. It makes the special flavor. We only have uh, these spores in this area. So like if you're trying to steal the piece, go ahead, take it. You can take it. I mean, we don't let you do that. But if you take it, if you take it back to uh, New York, then it's going to become uh, a New York sourdough in about 30 days. Because you cannot take the weather back to New York. 20 pounds of mother dough is enough to provide the yeast for a 200 pound batch of sourdough. Once the dough is mixed, we're going to check to see if the dough is mixed correctly. The way you can tell is you stretch it very, very, very thin, very thin, very thin. You see that? How it's going to be almost transparent, okay? That's how you can tell it's well developed. You see that? See that? You can always see my face in there, right through. See that? <laughs> Once every 20 minutes, a tub of mixed dough enough for 400 loaves of bread is dropped down to a divider that cuts it into chunks perfectly sized for a specific type of loaf a conical shaper then rolls it into a ball that is carried by conveyor belt to a resting basket where the dough can do its first rise after a half hour in the rotating basket the raised dough goes through a forming stage where it's given its next shape Breads are hand-stretched and gently shaped before they are wheeled into a cool, humidified closet. Once the dough gets mixed and shaped and stretched, now it goes away for another day. So we can put it in here. We won't bake it until, we'll bake it until tomorrow. Throughout the day at Boudin, Tourists from around the world line up with locals to shop for this one-of-a-kind sourdough bread. Hello and welcome to Boudin at the Wharf. And many come to the Bakery Museum to hear the tale of an immigrant baker who is in the right place at the right time. So the real story of Boudin is the gold rush. Now a lot of people came to dig for gold, but a lot of people came to so-called mine the miners. And one year after the gold rush, there were 70 bakeries in San Francisco. And Boudin was one of them. Boudin is the only one that survived, and it's the oldest continuously operating business in the city. The Boudins eventually sold the bakery to another immigrant baker. My father, Steve Girardo, came over in 1935 from Italy to San Francisco, and his first job was at Boudin Bakery, and everybody talks about artisan bread today. Uh, my father was one of San Francisco's authentic and original uh, artisan bakers. But as he made his bread, we'd go to school and we'd have sandwiches and we'd sit down at, at, a, at a bench in the schoolyard with all the kids that were eating um, peanut butter and jelly and, I don't know, mayonnaise sandwiches. They'd look at, on white bread, they'd look at us because the mustard would be falling out of our sandwiches because the bread had holes in it. That bread with holes is now flying off the shelves at Boudin. But despite the increasing demand, each loaf still gets hands-on attention. Uh, scoring the bread that is going to go into the oven. After those three days that we talked about, this is the final step before it gets baked. It gets scored for looks. At the same time, it gets scored to release the gases so the bread comes out nice and even. Otherwise, if we just throw it in like this, it's going to burst to the weakest part of the skin. We got an oven that varies from about 400 to about 440 degrees. Um, and then you also have to steam it. If you don't give it uh, steam, it's gonna look all gray. But this will give it a nice crust, and actually it will make it expand even more on the oven. You'll see that right now. Average time is around 20 to 30 minutes, depends on the size of the bread. And then press start. You'll feel the steam. And you see the steam coming out right now? A good loaf of bread. See that nice uh, crusty color? Ooh, hot. See that crunch, crunchy? Uh, we chewy on the inside, the, the scores are very nice and even. You know, that means these lines here. And also, you know, 
you see you tap it, make sure it's hollow. If it was, uh, you can feel it if it's still underdone, but it's a different sound. You see the echo? Beautiful. And then, look at that. How crunchy. Take a piece of these. Mm. Flour, water, and salt. Doesn't get any better than this. Ah, I love it. When, when It makes my day when I see the something that started three days ago and it comes out to this good. I'm happy. We now return to bread on Modern Marvels. Wheat may be the basis for most breads, but corn is an American specialty. The grain that first grew on this continent has been a key source of nutrition for its Native American inhabitants. Today, we call it cornbread, and its centuries-old traditions are preserved at places like Big Mama's Southern Barbecue in Pasadena, California. Beauty. <laughs> Dorgan McWhorter and his children run Big Mama's restaurant. He's almost cut that thing good as your old daddy. It's named in honor of the family matriarch, Emma Sue McWhorter, who provided the original recipes. Big Mama is my mother and his grandmother. And she's, she's from, um, Big Mama was born in Georgia. She learned from her grandmother, who was part Cherokee. You ready to whip up a batch of some hot water cornbread? Yes. Southern cooking was heavily influenced by Native American dishes, which relied on corn. That looks like uh, two cups of cornmeal. When the wheat-loving Europeans settled the continent, they disparagingly referred to cornbread as Indian bread. It became stigmatized, associated with hardship and poverty. This is hot water cornbread. Now this has been passed down for centuries. Hot water cornbread is held together by superheating the cornmeal to make it congeal. To form the patties, the hands must be icy cold to keep it from sticking. Then it's fried. This soul food staple has its roots in Native American cooking. A lot of the southern uh, African Americans married into the Indian tribe. Soul food is a, a blend and mixture of everything. As cornbread became a staple of southern cooking, New ingredients were gradually added, like pork fat, sugar, buttermilk, and eggs. Delicious. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Family recipes became jealously guarded secrets. <laughs> and you couldn't get it. You couldn't get the recipe. They would not give it to you. All right, give me, will you give me the recipe for your cornbread? No. <laughs> we may never learn the recipe of Big Mama's cornbread, but another bread has had the same recipe for 2,000 years. Altar bread, also known as a communion wafer, is used in the sacrament of communion in the Catholic Church. It is made only of flour and water, reflecting the Last Supper in which Jesus broke unleavened bread with his disciples. Still, how it is made and where it is made are not widely known. In most of the world, nuns bake the holy wafers. But in the United States, 80% of the bread that is placed on the tongues of faithful Catholics is produced here. In the village of Greenville, Rhode Island, the Cavanaugh family has been baking altar bread for the last 40 years. Well, it started with my grandfather, who was... Uh inventor with about 120 patents to his name. Kavanaugh's parish priest asked him to invent a machine that local nuns could use to increase their production of altar bread. It was the 1950s, when fewer and fewer American women were entering convents. By the 1960s, even with Kavanaugh's help, the remaining nuns could no longer keep up with baby boomer demand for the holy wafers. So it was at that time that Kavanaugh Company began baking and supplying the nuns or convents with the breads rather than the equipment that it was good for them, good for us, so it worked well. Kavanaugh Company has devised a way to make something beautiful and edible from just two ingredients. Well, by canon law, we cannot put in any material other than flour and water. So we're really limited, but the equipment that we have is able to uh, manufacture quite well with those requirements. The unleavened flour and water mixture is streamed onto heated baking sheets and baked for 95 seconds into a thin, rigid sheet of bread. 
The rotary die cut seals the edges of the bread, so nothing can chip off. A tumbler separates the large breads from the small, and like-sized wafers are sucked up into pressurized tubes, whisked away to packaging. Each day, Cavanaugh Company produces about 9 million pieces of altar bread. My favorite wafer by far is the inch and a half special. Uh, there are three separate, unique, beautiful designs done by my father and uncle. The bread also has increased wheat germ in it that gives it extra flavor and extra color. When you do go up to the altar and receive, it's, it's a much more significant wafer. And in a remarkable change in American preferences, whole wheat wafers account for over 60% of Cavanaugh's altar bread orders. Across the continent, another round bread is tumbling out of the oven, answering the burning question, how does the pita get its pocket? On the Day of the Dead in Mexican culture, celebrants eat pan de muerto, bread of the dead, embellished with a crossed bones design. Bread will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to bread on Modern Marvels. The earliest bread was flat, unleavened, and round. The early Greeks called it pita, and its popularity spread around the Mediterranean. Today in the U.S., pita is favored as a sandwich bread because of its unique ability to form a pocket. Nobody can take a bread and go like this in the market and then open it again like this and be able to open it and use it. Nobody can do that. They have tried. A lot of people came and tried that. And they will never be able to do that because they don't know what they're doing. Albert Boyajian seems to know what he's doing. He's built a successful pita bread business in Pacoima, California. The bake something for everyone. Arab bread for the Arabs. Kosher Masada brand pita for the Israelis. Lavash for the Lebanese. And whole grain for the vegans. Albert grew up in Syria eating handmade pita. His goal has been to duplicate that taste in quantity. The process at Global Bakery begins with mixing a half ton of dough at a time. In a trough, the dough is then hoisted up and emptied into a machine that divides it and rolls it into perfect balls. Those are dropped into baskets to rest and ride for a 20 minute cycle while the gluten relaxes and the dough rises. Next comes the sheeting process, where the dough ball is rolled flat in one direction, making it oblong, and then at right angles to make it round again. After a period of proofing, the sheets of dough head to the oven for an intense 20 to 40 second bake at 700 to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the magic of the pita pocket takes place. Oxidation on the surface of the dough seals the exterior of the bread. Inside, millions of tiny bubbles of carbon dioxide expand rapidly, filling with superheated steam, causing the bread to expand like a hot air balloon, until it naturally springs a leak. Look at this one here. Each one of them would have an air vent on the bottom. That's where the air is going to come out. Don't ever put your fingers in front of the air vent because the temperature is coming out is very hot. If you look at it, just put your hand there and push this. It's very, very hot. The steaming pita pockets begin to cool as they head up the conveyor belt to circle the bakery. After the breads take a lap around the factory, workers gather them, inspect them, stack them, and send them along for wrapping and shipping to Global's customers. We sent all the way to New York, to Florida. Sometimes we ship pita bread from here to New York. The airfare is 10 times more than the pita bread. While pita is embraced by many ethnic cultures, a loaf of challah has special significance for religious Jews. It's Thursday evening, and things look quiet at Continental Bakery in Valley Village, California. But behind the scenes, a full crew will work late into the night to bake challah, a soft, sweet woven bread, traditionally made with lots of eggs. The loaves will be sold the next day for the Friday evening celebration of the Jewish Sabbath. Yes, I want an egg challah slice, please. Continental is a kosher bakery and is regularly inspected by a rabbi to be sure it adheres to kosher rules. What makes a bakery kosher is the ingredients. Real good. Well, what does it mean, ingredients, kosher? 
God prescribes in the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, says these are the foods he may eat, these are the foods he may not eat. Well, the, the role of a rabbi is, is, is very simple. He comes in, he knows what is kosher, he knows what's not kosher. He'll just walk in here and he just looks in the pantry. What are you using today? And you do not know when he is going to be showing up. Challah for the Sabbath celebration is always woven in the same way, from the same number of strands. Now at the moment, we are rolling the bread, kneading the bread, shaping the bread into strands for braiding. So you need six strands for each loaf. So we are shaping them in groups of sixes. And then uh, we've got Onan over there actually doing some of the braiding. And now Simon's doing some of the braiding too. Claudio and I are shaping strands. The word challah refers to the portion of a baker's bread that in ancient times was set aside and donated to the temple. That donation is symbolized today by a ritual in which the baker throws a small portion of the dough into the oven as a sacrifice. Along with the loaves of challah are the special orders. Simon is going to be making an eight pound twist for us tonight. And he's using the egg dough. Uh, some of the larger ceremonial events, like a baby naming or a, an upshrin when a child turns three years old, a boy has his first haircut, uh, weddings, bar and bat mitzvahs, uh, ceremonial halls will be used. Over the next eight hours, not only are 1,100 loaves of challah woven and baked, but all the rest of the bakery's goods are finished as well. And a tradition, thousands of years old, continues. Tradition is also at work in the making of this ancient form of bread, which is also the favorite bread of America's astronauts. The Italian word for a round, flat bread, pizza, comes from the Greek word, pita. Bread will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to bread on Modern Marvels. If you were an astronaut, what kind of bread would you take on a space mission? When you consider that crumbs would be a terrible nuisance in zero gravity, it's easy to see why the flour tortilla is NASA's favorite space bread. La Reina Tortilla Factory in East Los Angeles, California, turns out over a million flour tortillas every day. To feed this nearly non-stop production, bulk flour and vegetable oil are stored in outdoor silos and pumped into the mixing stations inside. Lorena mixes the dough to their client specifications, adding baking soda or yeast, flavorings, and in some cases enzymes to extend the shelf life from the normal five days to 45 days or more for overseas clients. Workers drop the mixed dough through holes in the second floor to one of the 15 baking lines. This particular line is a hand stretch line. So uh, the dough that you saw being made in the mixers comes down to a rounder divider, and then it's proofed or aerated in these trays. After they go from the trays, they're dusted with flour and put into kind of like a, a rolling pin kind of process. And that goes through two kind of oval one way and oval the other way. So the ladies have to kind of make it round, obviously, and then put it through the system which goes through the oven for about 30 seconds at 300 degrees or so, and then goes through the cooling conveyors. Much of the machinery at La Reina was adapted from other baking tools like pizza rollers by company founder Mauro Robles. Uh, my father came to the United States as an immigrant from Mexico. He met my mom at a small tortilla factory where he worked and uh, that's how he got the idea of making tortillas. What do you, what do you think, Dad? How does that look to you? He went from corn tortillas at that factory to flour tortillas in his own business, and uh, that's how Lorena started. The first tortillas were made of ground corn, a grain that was hybridized from wild grains around 3000 BC in Central America. 
Corn tortillas remain the bread of choice there. In Mexico, over 300 million are consumed every day. Today, Lorena makes equal numbers of flour and corn tortillas, but nearly all their corn tortillas are made into corn chips. They ship their wheat flour tortillas to all corners of the U.S., as well as to Europe, Japan, and China. While tortillas can be packed and shipped across the continent, other breads are made to be eaten the same day they are baked. At Masab, an Ethiopian restaurant in Los Angeles, California, customers are served one of the healthiest breads in the world, injera, made daily on the premises. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, Ethiopian okay. traditional restaurants. We serve all our guests with injera, what we call it. Injera is made with teff. Teff is the world's smallest grain. In fact, its name means easy to lose. It takes 125 grains of teff to equal one grain of wheat. But these tiny grains, grown almost entirely in the Ethiopian highlands, are packed with vitamins and minerals and are gluten-free. Once it's cooked and cooled, the spongy pancake-like bread has several uses. Once they prepare stews and they prepare it and bring it in traditional manner with big plate and everybody's around there and take a piece of injera and scoop on injera so to eat the stews. So we don't use no utensils, everybody use hands. That's how we use it traditionally. One special Ethiopian ritual is called Gershaw. It's considered a friendly gesture to feed a friend, depending on the size of the bite. While injera is part of the social fabric of Ethiopia, bagels have evolved from European roll to American phenomenon. I like it warm. Uh, you know, some people say hot. I don't think a hot bagel is good, but a warm bagel, you know, that's it's been baked and is warm, it's out of the crunch, that's what I like. Richard Friedman knows about bagels. He owns Brooklyn Bagel Bakery in downtown Los Angeles and has been around bagels all his life. My grandfather came to this country in the early 1900s uh, as a baker. He started the Bagel Bakers Union. It was one of New York's most exclusive unions. Only sons of members could become apprentices, like Richard's father. They rolled out strips of dough, and then that dough was wound around your fingers and cleaved to the bench. But that ended in the 60s, with a machine that could form some 400 bagels an hour. The front part of the machine is called a divider. And what that does, it cuts off the desired piece. And then that piece comes down the belt and winds around the mandrel and actually forms a circle. And that's called the former. Bagels are made with the same wheat-based flour as most breads, so it's the next step that really makes a bagel a bagel. Bagels are cooked in boiling water, which makes them unique. It stops the yeast action and also puts a shine on the bagel. It's the only bread product, probably, that is cooked in boiling water before it's baked. Bagels are said to have been invented by an Austrian baker in 1683, who wanted to give a gift to the King of Poland. The king was a great horseman, so the baker made a roll in the form of a stirrup. Today, Brooklyn Bagels bakes over two dozen different kinds. The water bagel, or the plain bagel, is still the most popular, and the second most popular would be onion. And probably after that, uh, cinnamon raisin has become very popular. We do not make uh, spinach and cheese. We, we draw the line somewhere, but uh, we, we're making a lot more than they made uh, years ago. Yeah, if my father would see this today, he would, uh, he would probably say, chocolate chip and strawberry? Uh, they wouldn't fly. Tradition may be out the window in bagel shops, but it's returning in the form of handmade artisan breads. And American bakers are in the vanguard. Teff grain provides over two-thirds of the human nutrition in Ethiopia. Bread will return on Modern Marvels, here on History. We now return to bread on Modern Marvels. White bread may still be the biggest selling bread in America, but there is also a growing movement toward natural whole grains and handmade breads. It's called the artisan bread movement, and it began across the bay from San Francisco in Berkeley, California. One of the first to open an artisan bread shop was Steve Sullivan at Acme Bread Company. Bread in the 70s was increasingly made faster and faster and faster. 
with more and more leavening, more and more dough conditioners, less and less time for the dough to, to develop flavor, and consequently texture. Sullivan's Bakery emphasized handmade breads with natural ingredients and no preservatives. That meant that people had to come daily to get their fresh baked bread, and they did. The sales area in the bakery was so small that people had to line up outside. Sullivan had found the right recipe, and the movement spread, inspiring dozens of similar small bakeries, like Artisan Bakers of Sonoma, California, just an hour north of Berkeley. Here, owner Craig Ponsford works in his bakery laboratory to solve the mysteries of bread without chemical additives. I've been able to get up to a 10-day shelf life on a loaf of bread, for example, with an all-natural solution. The combination of these things will inhibit mold and bacteria and, and maintain softness and freshness and things like this. So that's been real fun for me, kind of still trying to maintain my goal of my original bakery is to, to feed people the healthiest product I can. Ponsford's passion for handmade breads inspired him to enter an international bread-making competition in 1996 as a specialist in baguettes. To the shock of the bread-baking world, his baguettes won first prize, beating even the French. It was pretty, pretty exciting. <laughs> that led him to become advisor to the U.S. baking team. That smells fantastic. Competing at the Coupe du Monde de Boulangerie, the World Cup of Baking. It's held in Paris once every three years to decide which nation has the best bakers. Twelve countries compete for the prize. Each three-person team must bake specific types of breads and pastries, as well as create an artistic display made entirely out of bread dough. Competition is fierce, and the bleachers fill quickly with the passionate fans who come to cheer for their country's bakers. Over 80,000 spectators pass through this hall. Bakers are in constant motion for eight straight hours as they rush to mix, knead, and bake the required 60 baguettes, country breads, original recipes, and assorted pastries, as well as the spectacular artistic displays that reflect the national pride of the bakers. The judges grade on the quality of the bake, the originality of the breads and pastries, and the artistry of the bread display. Sometimes there are real surprises, like in 2002, when the host French team burned the baguettes, and the Japanese team took first place. The American team has performed remarkably well over the years, winning the silver in 2002, and the gold cup twice in 1998 and 2005. Back in the States, the next generation of bakers is studying to be even better than their mentors. This is the San Francisco Baking Institute, the nation's preeminent school for all natural artisan baking. Founder Michel Suas saw a need for this in the early 1990s. The artisan movement started at the same time the good food came to the, to the restaurant. So chefs started to request better bread for the table. And so it was a teamwork between the restaurant industry and the baking. And the consumer who consumed those bread in the restaurant started to be interesting to find those in the supermarket and local bakery. So it was a constant movement with the quality bread that didn't exist before. By experimenting with sourdough starters and natural ingredients, artisan bakers are discovering ways to make tastier, longer lasting breads. These miche that they're baking now um, will be fresh for at least a week at room temperature. There are no preservatives in them. The sourdough acts as a natural mold inhibitor and it also helps to retain moisture within the bread so that um, it does retain its freshness. Though Suas was trained in France, he believes American bakers will be in the vanguard for developments in bread baking. As the, the crown. Yeah. We have no tradition where we need to follow. Like if you are a French baker, you have to follow with a strict rule to make a baguette. Here, we have rule, we have basis, but we improvise. We improvise what to do with it to make the best flavor coming out of it. Some of the French should come here to relearn how to make good bread. Today, locally baked natural artisan breads account for 11% of all bread sales in America. And that number is rising, 
faster than instant yeast. Nie, to już nie fajnie, bo macha nie przyleczamy. Cześć, dobra.